Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. It's uh, the, I guess it's the 30th today, if I'm not mistaken. No, it's the first, actually, May 1st and on Sunday. So I just uh, got back. I couldn't do the live class yesterday. Uh, I was just um, flying in from Tokyo. I did uh, about four trips in a row and I'm off to Seoul, Korea tomorrow. So pretty busy. So this is sort of just I'm doing the recording for everybody uh, today. So hopefully I'm, I'm a little overtired and jet lag. So hopefully I'm a little bit sharp uh, just with the discussion here and um, the presentation of uh, the material. Uh, so I'll do my very best. Anyway, thanks for coming. And um, what we'll do today is just sort of continue on a discussion on um, on Nirvana, the sort of second part of uh, sort of the presentation of that. And again, a lot of the material here, most of it actually is just going to be drawn from um, the Asia, Asian Classics Institute course number two. Uh, and these sort of discussions on Nirvana and that, as well as, a little, of course, always my background in Lomrim and uh, Three Principal Paths and so forth and other material from the Glupa tradition. Okay, so let's sort of get started here, um, just here in my place in Vancouver. Nice sunny day here and um, nice to meditate with everybody. Okay, so just take a moment just to sort of uh, bring ourselves here into this uh, time and space here. We're here, we're now, present moment. And we can just sort of set our intention. Um, we can't uh, have a bodhicitta intention, whatever we're doing uh, today together, we're doing for the enlightenment, uh, benefit, healing of all sentient beings. You know, our own enlightenment in order that we become Buddha to lead all sentient beings to enlightenment. Okay, so adjusting our view to emptiness here, just reading the Heart Sutra. Homage to the profession of wisdom of the Blessed Mother. Thus I have heard at one time the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajgir and Mass Vultures Mountain, got the great assembly of monks and the great assembly of bodhisattvas. That time the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of a phenomena called profound illumination. That time also the spirit of Alakashvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, was looking perfectly at the practice of profound perfection of wisdom looking perfectly at the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence. Then through the power of Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Sarva Lakshara, the body of the great being, how should a son of a lineage train who wishes to engage in the practice of the profound perfection of wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Sarva Lakshara, the body of the great being, replied to Venerable Shariputra as follows. Shariputra, whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage in the practice of profound perfection of wisdom, should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly at the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence. Form is empty and emptiness is form. The emptiness is not other than form and form is also not other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Shriputra, like this all phenomena are emptiness having no characteristics. They're not produced and do not cease. They have no defilement, no separation from defilement. They have no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shri Putra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no tactile object, no phenomena. There is no eye element and so forth, up to no mentality element, also up to no element of mental consciousness. There is no ignorance and no exhaustion of ignorance and so forth, up to no aging and death, no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there is no suffering, origin, cessation, or path. No exalted awareness, no attainment, also no non-attainment. Therefore, Sharyaputra, because there's no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and the in the perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no obstructions and no fear. Passing under beyond perversity, they attain the final nirvana. Also, all the Buddhas reside perfectly in the three times, having refined on perfection of wisdom became manifest complete Buddhas in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the equal of the unequal mantra, Mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, since it's not false, should be known as truth. Mantra perfection wisdom is proclaimed. Tayata, Om Gade Gade Paragade Parasam Gade Bodhisoha. Shariputra Bodhisattva, the great being, should train the profound perfection wisdom like this. Then the Blessed One arose from that concentration, said to Sparvalakshara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, that he'd spoken well. Good, good, son of Lynch is like them. Since it's like that, just as you have revealed in that way, the profound perfection wisdom should be practiced, and Tathagatas will also rejoice. 
When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra, Spirit of Alishra, the body of the great being, the entire circle of disciples, as well as worldly beings, gods, humans, demigods, and spirits, were delighted and highly praised what had been spoken, what had been spoken by the Blessed One. Okay, I'll just uh, recite the Prashapamita Mantra um, uh, seven times here. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhi Soha Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhi Soha Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisattva Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisattva Om Gate Gate Paragate Para sam gache bodhisattva. Okay, so for a meditation, let's take a moment to visualize that we're in a wide open space, grounds like lapis lazuli. We're just going to do sort of a shorter meditation, a simpler one today. And um, the grounds like lapis, uh, beautifully uh, smooth and sort of polished, warm, uh, soft touch, easy to sit on. And we're surrounded by all sentient beings of uh, the six realms of samsara. Uh, starting with the people closest to us, our, kind of our own little inner mandala here. Uh, mother on our left, father on our right, uh, people we love the most as support, people we like the least as objects of our practice, uh, compassion, love, and wisdom. And moving up from there, just sort of concentric circles outwards. We can just feel it's all human beings in the human realm here and other different dimensions. Just people from all over the world, all different places, backgrounds, and so forth, all here together meditating, practicing. Countless uh, animal beings from the animal realms, from insects all the way up to large mammals, birds, and so forth. I would say from the sky, the earth, and the sea. Just the incredible diversity of animal life here in uh, our dimension here, our planet, other planets, just from little tiny insects and bacteria and so forth up to really, really complex primates and so forth, and animal, uh, mammals. Uh, my first teacher always said that technically uh, plants uh, don't aren't considered sentient beings, I guess, by definition, maybe you'd have to look at the uh, Abhidharma teachings or so forth, but they have a subtle body, they have sort of a soul body, they have energy, I mean, uh, some plants maybe, you know, do they definition of sentient beings, of course, having a mind, object possessor, but also wanting to be happy and not wanting to suffer. This is uh, ironically the same definition Aristotle gives in De Anima. Um, so animals even have an imagination. They, uh, in other words, they can, pos they can posit possibilities of alternate viewpoints or changes or in other words, because they have to move towards happiness or what's beneficial for them to move away from suffering. So they can always posit an alternate set of affairs as a way of planning and stuff and how they sort of orientate themselves in the world. So who knows, but that the case, maybe plants are kind of like sentient beings a little bit, it's hard to say. 
I'm not an expert, but uh, it's nice to include basically the whole living world here with us, all of Mother Earth or Gaia. Then just as buried and as numerous, all the different beings in the spirit world, uh, astral realm, ethereal realms, elemental planes, and so forth. From little tiny uh, sort of simple spirits, very, very complex ones. You know, dragons, wizards, and elves, and whatever you want to have from all different sort of cultural backgrounds and so forth. They're all here with us. Different god and demigods, uh, sort of celestial beings. Think of desire realm beings, uh, um, form and formless realm gods, and so forth. All different planes of existence that are hard for us to even comprehend. And then countless beings, maybe even the majority, we could say, just in the, from the realms of, uh, you could say, shadow or kind of Hades or whether the realms of suffering or darkness. Darkness, of course, in terms of darkness of their own ignorance, we can just think of all hell beings and uh, hungry ghost beings and so forth. And their lives are, of course, horrible while they're in those states karmically and karma runs out, they get out. Uh, but while they're there, they're trapped in sort of nightmarish existences. Um, so we can just feel while they're here with us, just kind of virtually or sort of, um, you know, metaphorically, so to speak, uh, whatever you want to call it, they're just very, very happy to meditate and get dharma and to sort of for all of us to be kind of like the, the, the whole family, the sentient being family here doing uh, dharma together. Now above us is a beautiful clear blue sky. And just keep it simple today. We're just going to visualize the main figure for Lama Chopa, offering the spiritual guide practice which is Lo Seng Tuve Dorje Chang, the threefold figure of Che Sung Kappa, Buddha Shakyamuni, and Buddha Shakyamuni's uh, Sambo Gakaya or angelic form of um, the conqueror of Vajradhara and his partner, uh, Vajradhara Ishvari. So in the sky, just built like a big sun, we visualize Che Sung Kappa and uh, we won't, we'll put him on a throne. It's just gonna be like a yogi, just sort of floating in the air, kind of like levitating. Uh, and his body's made out of uh, light uh, or energy. So it's um, as we usually see him in all the Tonkas and statues, our wonderful Tibetan saint from the 1400s. And he's in the three robes of monk, yellow pants hat, in lowest position. And this, uh, the mudras here, of course, are for Lama Chopa, so he has a begging bowl from this nectar in his left hand, in his lap. Right hand is in the mudra of teaching, and next touching the um, thumb at his heart, holding a white lotus that blossoms at his right shoulder. Now, his heart is Buddha Shakyamuni, the Buddha, how we usually visualize him, you know, golden energy, three robes of a month, lotus position, and again, Begging bowl in his left hand, the nectar, right hand is in the subduing mudra, touching the earth. Let the earth be my witness that I deserve enlightenment because I have created the karmic causes for it. And now, at his heart, his higher form, angelic form, Gankar Vajra, Vajra Tushvari. So they both are there in sexual embrace. So uh, Vajra is in lotus position, uh, holding, he's holding a bell in his left hand, uh, Dorji, a thunderbolt scepter in his right. Now, arms crossed like this, and then uh, it's behind Vajradhatushvari's back, so she's straddling him with her arms and lap, they're having sex, and um, she's got her arms around his neck, and she's holding a uh, skull cap with him, so that's her left, and curved knife, uh, cleaver, uh, trigo knife in her right hand. And they're beautiful, they're young, they're wearing crowns, and have jewelry and silks and so forth. You know, kind of representing the uh, unity of opposites, yin and yang, and so forth, unity of all existence. So beautiful threefold figure. It's kind of like the Russian dolls. We open them up and smaller and smaller. The big one, Jason Kapp, open up the little one in his heart. Uh, but uh, open up the, then the little one inside that is um, Vajdara and Vajdara So representing you can, in some ways, you could say kind of um, three principal paths as uh, you know, metaphorically. So renunciation in the figure of Jason Kappa being incredible yogi and scholar and monk, renouncing you know, the causes of samsara, engaging the three higher practices from the Hinayana paths in particular of uh, moral discipline. So good ethics and discipline, concentration, 
uh, meditation and wisdom realizing emptiness. The three main causes that get you out of samsara. And Buddha Shakyamuni represents the um, Mahayana paths, in particular bodhicitta, in the sense of all love and kindness and great compassion. Development of all sentient beings. Kind of the heart, beating warm heart of Buddhism. And in his heart, the divine couple there, uh, beautiful blue, uh, represent tantric paths. Vajrayana path, Vajrayana, which is just particular for Anuttara Yoga uh, Tantra, just getting enlightened using all the sort of uh, spiritual and psychic technology to reach enlightenment in one lifetime, using your most subtle mind to meditate on emptiness. And that sort of ends up producing great bliss and emptiness, unity of great bliss and emptiness, which is why it's sort of metaphorically given sort of an erotic form or metaphor in this visualization. Okay, taking refuge from our heart, I and all senti beings to achieve enlightenment, go for refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. I and all senti beings to achieve enlightenment, go for refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. I and all senti beings to achieve enlightenment, go for refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Bodhicitta, which is we collect by no perfections, may become Buddha for the benefit of all. With the riches we collect by giving no perfections, may become a Buddha for the benefit of all. And through the virtues we collect by giving no perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Just realized we haven't done our nine point breathing. So at this um, point, we can just feel that just in, and, uh, sort of with, uh, having. Three figures here, Jason Kappa Buddha and the fine couple is uh, our witness and all sentient means we're leading all sentient means. We'll just do one round here. Three breaths, obviously out the inhale from the left, exhale through the right, getting rid of desire, uh, desirous attachment, so forth, um, being hung up on things, being stuck. Either way around three breaths in through the right nostril, out through the left, anger, reactivity, frustration, so forth. And three deep breaths in and out through both nostrils, and then holding the final uh, breath, final inhalation at our navel, a little bit below our belly button, inside our body, put our mind there, and uh, just feel that our breath being held, the mind and prana are all mixed together, and then exit. Okay, so just finishing up on your own time and just cultivating in your mind here, just in your heart, refuge in the three jewels. As I said refuge being a mind of uh, fear and faith. So fear and suffering, we don't want to suffer. We want shelter. We want refuge from the suffering and the faith or confidence that we have in the three jewels to uh, give that ultimate um, this uh, refuge or sort of medicine or true sufferings of samsara, in particular old age, sickness, and death. And in particular, this being uh, the Dharma jewel uh, refuge in uh, emptiness. 
Okay, and just feel that white light connectors are coming down from the heart of Vajdara and Vajradhatu Ishvari. Again, purifying us in all sentient beings, flushing out all of our negativities, obscurations and obstructions and so forth, bad energy, all coming out of us in the form of ashes and soot, rancid oil, evil spirit interferences. We can just look at sort of, you know, insects or bugs or yucky things coming out all making us crystal clear. And now golden lights and uh, energy coming forth uh, from a divine couple from their sort of heart space shared between the two of them dissolving into us and all sentient beings, sort of powering us up, kind of like a video game. We're sort of getting uh, more and more sort of luminous, free and bright and happy. And just kind of like sunshine coming down from the sun. Now the four miserables, just may everyone be happy, may everyone be free from misery, may everyone ever be separated from their happiness, may everyone have equanimity free from hatred and attachment. Golden lights continue to come down, this time it's coming out of us like a big bubble of energy or light, and sort of giving out, it's kind of like a waterfall, so we're, you know, like some elaborate fountain where the water comes down into a little, little statue or something, or a little cup and then it overflows and goes down, the same kind of thing coming out of us, our Buddha's here, uh, love, uh, wanting all sentient beings to be happy, compassion, not wanting them to suffer, joy, sort of an act of affirmation, and deep, deep peace and love for all beings. And um, equanimity, being beyond these sort of poles or dichotomies or dilemmas of, um, Sort of stuck between hatred and attachment or clinging, open fear, all these kinds of things. Instead, having just sort of a warm, kind, friendly, open attitude towards all beings, treating them all as equal, all as loved, all as uh, worthy of being loved and uh, describing their true nature. the seven limb practice foundation for our buddhist practice just offering prostrations we prostrate body speech and mind to the merit field here so making physical prostrations with us and all sentient beings singing praises mantras and dharanis mental attitude of great great devotion to the sacred which is that which is worthy of respect and of course seeing our own buddha nature the emptiness of our own mind in that of buddhas as being identical so it's honoring ourself and honoring the spirit world, honoring all others, sort of the divine, she would say like Namaste and divine, and sort of honoring the divine and everybody and everything and showing that great, great love and respect to that and devotion. Now offerings, you can just emanate out wonderful offerings in all directions, whatever you like. It's still cherry blossoms are almost done here in Vancouver and in Japan. So I just like to visualize that's my favorite, just beautiful sakura, like beautiful cherry blossoms in all directions, like falling like rain. Years ago, we were in Koyasan, Sacred Mountain Shingon tradition, where a mummy of Kukai Kobodai, she is in just outside of Kyoto. And we were out walking at night through the big cemetery there, through all the temples alone, just uh, Chrissy and I and two friends, uh, one of our best friends, Bill. And I think it might have been a full moon. So had this beautiful, clear sky and sort of this silvery white moonlight. It was all the cherry blossoms, uh, like pink snow falling in the wind and just everywhere. It's just so magical. So a lot of times I'm sending all that out as an offering to uh, the holy beings here.
Okay, confession and rejoicing. So again, just psychoanalytically deep down, we're all monsters. We're all jerks. We're all assholes, so to speak. We all know it. Everyone else knows it. And we are on the path of healing, the path of individuation, the path of self-overcoming to sort of heal all this. I think it's Maya Angelou's. I always like that uh, quote. You know, we see it on the internet. When I see an angry person, I see someone hurting which is really beautiful. So we're all hurting in our own ways for so, for so many different reasons. And we're all jerks because we're, you have know, our self-cherishing and reaction, our self-grasping in response to that suffering. And so we acknowledge this, we own it. It's our responsibility, even if it's not our fault. And uh, we will overcome it. We will let it go. We will heal it and even make that an offering. And rejoicing, let's rejoice at our own, all the holy beings, all the wonderful things they do, sentient beings doing all great things. But in particular, let's really rejoice in our own Buddha nature, the emptiness of our own mind. We can change uh, and we will change uh, because our mind is empty. It has no self nature. We are a complete openness to the world. A philosophy professor years ago, 30 years ago, always when teaching Aristotle said that mind is a sheer openness, whatever content you put in it, it, it takes on the laws of that content. So with their open heart, if you fill it full of crap, you become a crappy person. If you fill it full of love and goodness, you become a good person. But the thing is, is that, um, that we can change. This is the whole path of Dharma is doing that. We have all these bad habits and character flaws and character armor. We can, and none of that's fixed or permanent. All those kind of identities and all the things we hang on to are completely plastic and flexible. And we can just like a, a computer program or a book, we can rewrite ourselves in a better way and create well, one that uh, mm. gives us all sorts of love and uh, kindness and wisdom to all sentient beings. So let's rejoice in that. You know, offering up a uh, wonderful, first of all, a white lion throne, a uh, beautiful square white lion throne we send up dissolves into uh, Jason Kappa asking, please, uh, all Buddhas and light beings, always stay with us. And then we send forth a golden uh, eight spoked uh, Dharma chakra, please continue to teach us, be in our lives, guide us. And finally, dedicating everything we're doing for the uh, enlightenment, uh, enlightenment of all sentient beings. Okay, offering the mandala here, purified universe from our hearts, the ground sprinkled with perfume and spread the flowers, the great mountain, four land, sun and moon, and as the Buddha lion offered us. All beings enjoy such pure lands. I offer love at least sense of loss, the objects that give rise to my attachment, hatred, confusion, my friends, enemies, strangers, their bodies, and enjoyments. Please bless me and be released from the three poisonous minds ignorance, anger, and attachment. We send forth this jewel of mandal to you, precious gurus. Om Manam Guru Radha Mandala Kamriti Amin. So, offering up as sort of an act of generosity and open heartedness, opening us up. I offer this beautiful universe, purified universe of goodness and beauty up to the merit field. And in response by offering up, so reciprocity circle of giving here, just all beautiful golden nectar comes down again, in particular from the heart, uh, uh, sort of the shared heart of Vajadar and Vajadatu Ishvari. Golden nectar is very blissful and joyful. This kind of light, just kind of like warm sunshine. So for us and all the sentient beings, that exception. And let's do the dissolution here. feel now that uh, upon receiving, uh, offering all these prayers and offerings and so forth, we're asking for our gurus here to dissolve into our heart. 
And so um, central figure there, Jay Sankapa, Buddha, and Vajradhar and Vajradhishwari start to sort of emit beautiful light out, just like the sun. And then Jay Sankapa starts to melt into that golden light, luminous glow, and just sort of dissolves inwards. At the same time, it's almost like he's condensing a little bit, you know, it's almost like you're going from water into ice a little bit, you know, it's all energy and light, but it's just sort of all that sort of energy is going inwards getting concentrated into Buddha Shakyamuni. And then he melts into golden light and sort of dissolves inward into his heart. So now it's just a divine couple. So Vajra uh, and Vajra Tushvari, they're very, very beautiful and they shrink to the size of your baby, your pinky fingernail here, or about the size of a little a piece of corn or a uh, sunflower seed. But of course, it's like a beautiful blue uh, jewel like a blue diamond or a piece of lapis or a blue sapphire. We have lighter energy. And oftentimes they get you to visualize the five elemental energies, the five elements or five uh, sort of main uh, winds or pranas in your body. So uh, white, uh, green, uh, yellow, red, and blue. It's basically like a rainbow coming out all directions, like a soap bubble. Let's please dissolve into us. And so um, they sort of float down to the crown of our head, about a foot above us, turn around so it's their face in the same direction as us. Then very, very slow, just like a leaf falling, or like a little dandelion seed on the wind, they start to come down into the crown of our head and slowly descend just in front of our spine. And once they get to our heart, just feel that they dissolve right into our heart, into our root mind there, our subtle mind. And then just like you've got a big bowl of water and you drop you know, a little bit of blue food coloring, it goes to sort of in all directions there. But at the same time, it's just like one mind going into another here, just one glass of water into another. It's completely seamless. Our Buddha nature and uh, Buddha nature, these holy beings are one and unified here, like yoga, yoking your mind, tying it to the mind of the divine. They're ultimately the same thing. They're empty. And then on a conventional level, they are clear awareness and primordial awareness. And just all the wisdom, compassion, and power going into us, all the Buddhas. And just meditating, just sense of uh, feeling of totality and bliss, feeling oneness, completion, peace, and joy. An act of happiness there, a power of creation, power of expression, all good energy.
Okay, it's coming out of meditation here. Okay, well, let's see, I've got just a few notes here for a second to put on the uh, teachings on Nirvana. Try and keep it next 20 minutes. I always say that and I always go over and I kind of get lost in my, <laughs> my own presentation, my own thoughts. So, but um, I think this is just basically about two pages of stuff. Here, so we'll, we'll see. Okay, great. So we were talking uh, about Nirvana last week. And this uh, week here, we'll talk about the four kinds of Nirvana, ways of sort of um, dividing that up. So uh, a lot of times you can see this in books, uh, different Abhidharma texts or whatever. I mean, I've seen this, these, this division before. I kind of can't remember where offhand, but uh, different you know, texts and teachings from the Buddha or, or Buddhist students. So number one being natural Nirvana. Number two, Nirvana with remainder. Number three, Nirvana with no remainder. And finally, the Nirvana of Buddhahood, which is beyond two extremes. Okay. So natural Nirvana will start is basically ultimate truth or emptiness. It's natural because uh, it's had this quality forever. It doesn't have a self nature. Okay. This is its emptiness. So basically just nominally, you can call it Nirvana. It's beyond all these kinds of uh, distinctions or uh, um, conceptual labels or so on and so forth. Right. We just sort of call it Nirvana. Um, I, I guess you could say sort of nominally, as a way of classifying it. Um, and right here is Nirvana too has its own natural Nirvana. And this is often what you hear is the emptiness of emptiness. Of course, the whole point of emptiness is that it isn't a particular thing, uh, right? So um, there's different ways of parsing. This is actually natural Nirvana. You, you could say when you read um, Rinpoche gave about two, uh, Zazu Rinpoche years ago, maybe in the 1980s gave, uh, uh, I think it was a two, we did it over two years of study at uh, Sterling Temple there, um, but I think he'd, he'd given it in the mid 1980s. I don't know if it was at Cortez Island or something, where he gave two different retreats on uh, Maitreya's Uttara Tantra, Mayana Uttara Tantra Shastra, which you can get, which is a really, really great book. And this is just all teachings on Buddha nature. Uh, so we spent, I think, about two years studying that or something. It's extremely uh, um, subtle and fairly complicated and very big. I know they study that a lot in the uh, Kagyu tradition and Nyingma tradition as well. There's a number of different uh, commentaries I've seen on that. Everyone's kind of got their own take. Uh, Sangha kind of got that, uh, these teachings directly from Maitreya in Tashita Pureland when he's kind of in sort of the psychic vision or actually traveled there and got this directly from Buddha Maitreya. So the... Um, the teachings themselves sometimes are a little, I don't know, a little hard to, to um, they're very pithy and a little hard to explain uh, or a little hard to understand. So it's good to get commentaries on that. But basically, you know, you've got the uh, Tathagata Garbha Buddha nature. There's like the natural Tathagata Garbha and developing Tathagata Garbha. So these really correspond a lot of ways to the two truths, uh, ultimate truth being emptiness and then con uh, conventional truth being karma or um, the, conventions, phenomena, any, um, you know, sort of the world of cause and effect. So uh, your, um, what's interesting, so in other words, your everyone has the same uh, uh, natural Tathagata Garbha, uh, which is basically everyone's mind is emptiness. A Buddha's mind is emptiness, uh, insect's mind is emptiness. Uh, every mind has its own ultimate quality of emptiness because everything has an empty, uh, ultimate quality of emptiness. So the developing Tathagata Garbha is just sort of, I guess you could see if, if emptiness is like empty space, kind of like the plane of energies within that empty space of karma. And that's your developing Tathagata Garbha. So it's, you have the potential to be, but technically you, on one level, you're already enlightened because your mind is empty, but there's the whole spiritual work you do of having a path of going the, the three principal paths up to the point where you end up self-discovering this or manifesting this so there's all different ways of saying this a lot of times you talk about sort of like a discovery model of um discovering the emptiness of your own mind of course being like zen or zogchen or whatever then what they call the sort of developmental model that you get a lot in the sarma traditions of tibetan buddhism like the Rupa tradition we do where it's sort of the long path um, up the mountain, so to speak, of st uh, studying sutras and doing your tantric practice and so forth. In the end, you get to the same place. And like I've always felt that technically it, it might be a bit of a misnomer uh, um, because 
uh, you know, like the difference between the discovery model and sort of the developing model, because as uh, one of our old teachers and friends, Annie Land McNeil, always said, you don't jump off the jump off the cliff, you fall off the cliff. In other words, once you create the appropriate uh, karmic causes for realization, these things are revealed or the realization dawns on you. So even walking up the path, there's a certain when the karma comes, there is sort of a discovery or a realization that happens. It's not something you intellectually fabricate or create like, okay, I'm having an experience of emptiness tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning when I sit down, da, da, da. It sort of happens. And of course, if you're doing tantric practice, it's your teacher that basically um, introduces you uh, or sort of you're in this relationship where they end up as... Socrates is being like almost like a Socratic midwife that helps you deliver your own inner realization of emptiness. So in Ashravana, that's what we're talking about that. And of course, emptiness is beyond, as an experience, beyond these sort of conceptual uh, designations and so forth. So the emptiness we're talking about sort of as a conceptual object, the emptiness you experience, of course, um, in a yogic direct perceiver is uh, empty of Ironically, those explanations and intellectual ideas of emptiness. So, you know, it's the emptiness of emptiness. And this is even one of the four bodies of the Buddha, which is, of course, what they call the Sobhavakikaya or the, um, the entity or nature body of the Buddhas, which, of course, there is no, it, it's the empty quality of the three other kayas the wisdom truth body, Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, enjoyment body, or beatific angel body, and the emanation or avatar body of Nirmanakaya, but um, the Nirmanakaya body of the Buddhas. So, all those three are empty and that's sort of the fourth body, but fourth, you know, like body of the Buddhas that's always already there, which is the emptiness of the other three bodies or a Buddha's mind and body, because everything has as its nature emptiness. So that's kind of like what we call a natural nirvana. Okay, we so ironically, I mean, this is why you say nirvana is not outside of you. Um, what you're looking for, the happiness you're looking for, the extinction of true sufferings that you're looking for, it literally is just in the empty sphere of mind. So this big elaborate Jungian journey we're on is, of course, to arrive at the same place. All those fairy tales and stories of great pilgrimages, uh, you know, even Lord of the Rings, you, you start at the Shire, you go to Mortar, and then you, you come back to the Shire. Your mind ha has always already been empty. You have always already had the same natural Buddha nature as the enlightened beings. It's just on a developmental model, of course, we're completely different. They are basically like angels, and we have these sort of, um, you know, the uh, meat sack of our organic existence here with all its true sufferings. Okay, so, but again, underlying that is your natural nirvana, which is always already there. You just have to basically activate it or discover it. So you're walking around in the dark at home, and I, I can't see anything, eh, I light a lighter, it doesn't work, eh, and then someone says, dude, there's a light, there's the switch, just feeling the wall, and your phone like, click, bing, goes on, it's like, oh my god, it was always here, this is, you know, the light switch was, I just had to figure it out, so the Buddha and your teachers are like showing me the little light switch there on the wall, okay, so, um, I have one thing, the four types of nirvana are in name only. Okay, so this is it. Like these are, I guess you in a lot of ways, say rhetorical divisions or classifications of something that's of course beyond classification, which is the emptiness of nirvana. So second, uh, we'll just include here natural nirvana. Okay, so um, yeah, this is of course, because it's empty, it's permanent. Whereas, uh, and it's unchanging. So that's very different than the mind. The mind is always changing, is always impermanent. The mind that we call mind is actually the label that we just put mind on the whole flow of uh, events, experiential events that make up our life, the kind of the movie of our life, so to speak. So our mind is always changing like a river. You know, we have the label river. It's always just like Heraclitus and Lao Tzu say, it's never the same river that I'm stepping in. Uh, so which one is it? Is it the same river? Well, you know, it, it's not changing into a different river. It's what I'm looking at, but it's always different because it's always changing. That's like the mind. Where is uh, nirvana or emptiness, of course, is always permanent and always changing. They say like space. The analogy they give is that it's like space. Okay. Um, Yeah, so this is so when you achieve nirvana, you are no longer causing suffering, not creating more suffering, but you still have your body. So, of course, this is the difference uh, compared to achieving full enlightenment with a, uh, becoming a Buddha, where you get rid of the five 
uh, contaminating aggregates all together uh, through Tantra, when you're doing just achieving nirvana, let's say sort of in uh, more of a like the intermediate scope of Lam Rim, let's say, um, you still, you're no longer, because you've seen emptiness directly, you no longer have any self-grasping at yourself or any other phenomena because you see it's empty. You see that it's not outside of your mind, but within your mind. And so you will never have grasping that, that would uh, sort of be the foundation for self-cherishing that would create negative actions of body, speech, and mind, you know, based on your grasping and so forth, creating more true sufferings because you've seen emptiness directly. However, you still have your contaminated meat sack and body and mind uh, full of all the negative imprints or seeds. The thing is, you're not going to activate them. Okay, so this is what's interesting. When you've achieved nirvana, you still have the packaging, so to speak. And it's kind of like a, um, a, uh, Tupperware container. So let's say you've got a Tupperware container that you've just, you've made your own homemade kimchi or something or um, uh, whatever, smoke kippers uh, in, or even butter or whatever. Like, you know, you, you get your little Tupperware container from Safeway or something and you put all smelly fish in it or garlic or something. And then of course you clean it, you know what it's like, it stinks. You still got the Tupperware container and it stinks. No matter how many times you clean it, you probably have to go get another one. It's a similar thing here in the sense that even once we uh, achieve nirvana, have a direct experience of emptiness uh, and hence get rid of what they call obstacles to liberation, right? Obstacles, all the intellectual and habitual day-to-day um, -day behaviors of body, speech, and mind. Those all go with our experience of emptiness, but we still have our regular on this level um, body bag, the flesh and blood, with all the seeds and negative imprints and the dispositions for bad habits and character flaws and everything else. They just won't be activated. So they're kind of late. And so you still have the old yogurt container or the old Tupperware container that stinks like kimchi, right? But the difference is that even that's there, you're fine with your body. It like your mind is, I should say, your body's well, how it is, but your mind is completely pure, right? Uh, so technically, the negative karma that's put you in a body of flesh and blood is still working itself out here. Those seeds are still sort of moving you forward in time. In other words, you're still living your life in this sort of contaminated world with a contaminated body. However, your mind is in nirvana, right? So you no longer have true sufferings. And so you get cancer um, in whatever your body's falling apart, you're old, you got a bad hip, you're in a wheelchair, whatever, um, you know, your body's just basically falling apart, but your mind is in a state of bliss. And your mind, when anytime you want, can go into a deep absorption of emptiness. When you come out of it, you see everything as just being sort of a virtual projection of your mind. Right? That's sort of the state of nirvana. And so that's that great German then, Arya Kema, says that uh, when you reach nirvana, there is... Uh, there is still, the way she puts it, I can't remember, I'm paraphrasing of course, but there is still suffering, but the one experiencing the suffering is gone, right? So there's still the movie of the samsara, the way it looks, but the point is true sufferings are gone from the, from the equation because the ego, it, that, that's the foundation for true sufferings, it's now been gone with your at, as once you've experienced nirvana and let's say you're an arhat or, or a foe destroyer so that's why yeah like you know you're a more old man but you, like an old man here uh seeing nirvana and i trip and fall with my my bad hip boat fall but i just experience bliss i don't have true suffering. i don't have the whole apparatus of ego that whole you know, fascist architecture of the ego, as Bruce Coburn will call it, you know, where all the judgments, why me, man, that me, mine, this, everyone against me, the world's against me, this sucks, oh, I've got cancer, eh, all that's kind of gone, and I feel deep, deep peace and deep, deep bliss uh, with nirvana, okay? But again, body's still here, seeds are still here, right? Um, so I have a note here. I, we've talked about this before. I've, I've mentioned this before. That's interesting. I, I got it. This is, I think, my, I guess you, Michael, might have given sort of an aside or talked about this, the idea of feeling and discrimination as being the uh, mental factors. These, in this case, are, it's part of the five omnipresent mental factors in any given moment of awareness. And he, I have here, which is interesting, why are these isolated uh, out from the, well, the main list? Why are they seen as so being so important, these two particular uh, mental factors? 
and that's because quote unquote they cause samsara. So the, the two impure aggregates create the bad karma of the past. Yeah, and then I put here feel and judge, feel and judge, feel and judge, and which equals samsara. Okay, so that's what's interesting is that um, again we're not talking about what it means to get fully enlightened and replace those contaminated aggregates with the uh, uh, 5D any Buddhas and the pure non-contaminants of a Buddha that you do through Tantra. That's maybe a little bit of another discussion there. But um, out of all our five aggregates, the ones that are the most important, of course, as we've talked about before, is the discrimination aggregate, which is allows you to see something as something. It allows you to sort of isolate in a figure ground, in terms of perception of figure ground motif, of one object that's determinate against the backdrop of their, all the other objects that are indeterminate. So I'm looking at my phone, let's say, it's, I'm seeing this not just as a metal plastic square or whatever, I'm seeing it as my phone, and I'm noticing this, and in the backdrop is everything else that I'm not noticing, the computer right here, my coffee cup, my, my little notebook here, and so forth. I'm in this moment paying attention to this. So, of course, this is what we talked about before. I'm seeing things as things. Of course, this is karmically determined. Things appear uh, in their aspect because of my past karma forcing me to see those things in that way as something, right? But I also have an effective content. I feel a certain way about them. I like them. I don't like them. I don't care. And of course, the like and don't like, there's either the happiness, the very temporary samsaric happiness or pleasure or suffering or, you know, some sort of negative uh, affectation. Um, what I like, I just saw a friend of mine went for coffee yesterday and we were, we were talking Dharma and stuff. And um, we talked about it. It's, you get something in Martin Heider, famous German philosopher in being in time. He says that with, disclose, uh, with the disclosiveness of human reality, in other words, that in your projects, things are turning up as something. And I'm getting a sense of self by being involved with them, right? I'm, you know, on my way to Walmart, in my car, seeing myself as the guy going to Walmart, running my daily errands at the store, and things are turning up or appearing as things that help me along with this task that gives me a sense of self. But at the same time, there's sort of a backdrop of a quote unquote mood, a moodiness in the sense that I'm always feeling a certain way about things, right? Uh, you know, what's the backdrop of my mood at that moment in my self project? How am I feeling? Am I happy that I have to run errands on my day off? Uh, am I miserable? I don't, I, I'm feeling bad in myself because of FYI, you know, I've only got to get up, I don't like my job. I mean, who knows, like you, 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 know, you can sort of spin all these different things. But in other words, there's a, a fundamental mood component. So the mood isn't something that you're passively receiving, uh, you know, as some sort of object or state. It's kind of, it's always already there in terms of your, the human reality. It's kind of like almost knitted into the fabric of your day-to-day -day life, your mood. So it's the same thing here, just with your feeling and discrimination. So once you've reached nirvana, of course, what, uh, what allows you to see this uh, and get rid of your true sufferings, of course, is that we're always feeling that the stuff is coming at you, you know, that the reason I'm in a good mood or bad mood is because of X, Y, Z, some external uh, agency or external factors or conditions that are making me feel a certain way. Um, where uh, is it's the same thing with discrimination, of course, things appear as something because that's the way they quote unquote are rather than the way I see them, the way they are for me, that's the way they are external to my mind. You know, this phone is always a phone. Uh, no matter what, it's a phone, right? But, it, but the fact is it's not. I mean, it's just, you know, like you say, the classic, um, Yes, my coach is, you know, the, the pen or the chew toy with the dog. Of course, if I had this there, you know, the dog might pull it off and start chewing on it or run away with it. Or um, um, There's um, a video you can see where monkeys have learned, you might have seen this, it's, it was a BBC thing, monkeys have learned to basically steal your phone when you're in certain places, India or China or whatever. And they... Um, I guess it, whatever it is like <laughs> extorting you or something you're walking around and then they grab your phone out of your back pocket or your purse and they'll only give it back if you give them something to eat you eat whatever you give them a bag of chips or something so anyway the point is they know it's important to you they don't know what the phone is of course right they just know that you'll give them food and addition so anyway the point is that's the emptiness of the phone is that it's of course a relative perception to whoever's perceiving it so um, when you come out of your experience of emptiness, of course, you, you, 
you have an experience of emptiness, then you come out and you see conventional reality, you'll see that your moods and your discriminating mind are yours. Your feelings are your feelings. You're based on your karma. The discrimination, how you see things as things is you. So the world's coming from you. It's not coming at you. Be responsible for it. And again, that alone takes out the whole judgmental attitude where why me, this can't, this isn't fair, or, you know, I don't like this, or, you know, eh, you know, in other words, I have no control. I'm just this passive victim in my life because my life is something external to me that's kind of being dropped on top of me, right? So that's what I want to say with the, the female discrimination part here. So um, now what are the, uh, the, the, of course, the other three are Nirvana with something left over and Nirvana with nothing left over. So of course, um, just like we've said, you can achieve Nirvana, let's say you're 40 years old and you achieve Nirvana, um, your mind is in the state of Nirvana, but your body still trucks along till the body karma runs out. So until you die of natural causes, die of cancer, maybe get hit by a car or something, I don't know, that that karmic, uh, so the envelope of those karmic seeds continues on in this life, kind of that movie continues on. But again, your mind is in nirvana. And so I always remember my um, first teacher saying, Kim Tessa Kirchner always said that, you know, our hats don't die, they pass. So it's kind of interesting. There's this idea, he'd say, maybe reading in the old Abbey Dharma teachings or something, or, or that when you're an arhat and you've, uh, again, no longer in samsara, you perceive nirvana directly, you have a stable realization of emptiness. Um, your mind is in that state of bliss and emptiness, right? Great, great peace, great, great bliss. And um, from no longer having any true suffering. So you're, you're an Arya being, technically. You're not a fully enlightened Buddha, of course, but you are an Arya being, a higher being, you're like a foe destroyer. You've gotten rid of your foes, your enemies, uh, which are your own delusions and observations and negative karma. And um, uh, you, are, you, know, are, you are a saint, right? You're a higher person, a very holy being for being that. Um, so when you die, it's just like your body dies. It's kind of like you leave your body, your mind's in that state. So let's say, unfortunately, let's say you get hit by a car, you're an old R hat walking on the street and crosswalk and whatever, someone hits me and I fall down, oh my God, I died. Now I'm still in this state. I know I'm not, accept, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not experiencing that as a true suffering. You know, I just pass, or let's just say I'm just old man and I just pass away in the hospital. You know, I'm in our hat and I'm just like in bed meditating on some emptiness. And then, oh, Matthew's body's given out. He's left his body. It's like his mind's still in samsara, but his mind is in the vanishing state. So body's kind of this in samsara manifestation. It drops off. So uh, nothing left in Nirvana, if nothing left over is you no longer have a body after you die after achieving Nirvana, but you still have karmic seeds. So it's interesting, let's say at the end of my life, uh, as I'm dying, I reach Nirvana. So I'm in the hospital, my meditation is amazing, but I, or I just leave my body that way as I die. I, my body's giving me out, I go into Nirvana, my body dies. Now my mind still has all the negative karmic seeds in it. And, and that's what gives me dualistic appearance, all those predispositions, but again, they're not activated, okay? Now then the other one is Nirvana, a Buddhahood beyond two extremes. So this is more in the Mahayana um, sense that I'm getting enlightened, uh, with bodhicitta in the whole tantric path, then you get enlightened, you perceive the two um, truths um, simultaneously, the ultimate truth and uh, conventional truth, which an arhat can't do. They can perceive one or the other. If I'm an arhat, when I go into meditation, I see emptiness. When I come out of meditation, I see conventional reality. I see karma. I see phenomena. I see cause and effect. I see uh, labeling, everything just being a projection mind in terms of the grammar of conceptuality and so forth. But when I'm a Buddha, I see both of those thoughts at the same time simultaneously, right? That makes it very, very special. But that's like a different path, as you know. So there's the five paths that we get from accumulation, preparation, seeing, uh, meditation, and no more learning. Or the beginning on a path, we're just all along the intermediate scope of the just taking you to be an arhat. And then there was those, are so, those same uh, five paths in more of a Mahayana context that allow me to get fully enlightened as a fully enlightened. So in the Glupa tradition, in the Tantric Vajrayana tradition that we're working in, we're looking at the Mahayana path. We want to get Nirvana, a Buddha, you know, two extremes. We don't want to just be in our hat. So we have to always train in Bodhicitta. Like my, again, my first teacher said that, you know, sometimes people don't have very good um, Bodhicitta. 
no judgment, but whatever. I mean, it's not easy. And they do, they're very good tantric practitioners. So they get a direct experience of emptiness. Let's say doing Yamantaka practice or great, you know, it's like I'm this Yamantaka yogi, I'm always in retreat. Bodhicitta is not good. And then I get an experience of emptiness using this tantra technology, but I end up as an arhat, which is interesting. I don't get fully enlightened as a Buddha, I end up as an arhat, which is amazing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, you know, whatever. It's like in Vancouver, you're, you're trying to go to, to Whistler, but you end up getting all the Squamish, like almost there, but not really there, right? Now, what's funny is I know in this class, I think it was this one, yeah, I guess you might have said that when you have an experience of emptiness, of course, um, as a, you know, stream enter, just I mean, my first perception of is before I become, before I have a proper stable experience of emptiness, like becoming our hat, like I just getting lumps of emptiness and so forth. At that point, I'm seeing a Buddha directly. What? I'm seeing the entity body or the um, nature body, so to speak, the fourth body of, of the Buddha. So I'm actually, in a lot of ways, in visionary contact with the Buddhas. So this idea of making a distinction between an arhat and, and a Buddha in the center, you know, basically, even once you become an arhat, the Buddhas at that point on this mystical level will start teaching you the rest of the way to get fully enlightened. So there isn't this, I remember when I started studying Buddhism, it's just like, hey, an arhat, do they just kind of leave you there in nirvana? It's like it, all the other people are sort of on the highway, you know, to, to full enlightenment. Meanwhile, you, you just sort of taking the off ramp to the, the truck stop there. And then your man is like, eh, not going anywhere, right? But technically that might be, I'm not, you have to ask the realized person first, but that might not, that might be just be a false distinction in the sense that, you know, like somehow our hats are left behind. Rather they're in that state. And then it's a further development that, that, that their path continues to fully enlighten, to full enlightenment just on their own in that sort of special spiritual state that they're in. You might just go to a peer line, get instructions. So, and then that has to, that has to, I would imagine, be a pretty quick process. If you have, uh, if you're in Nirvana and, and, and are an Arhat, basically it's just about, um, at this point, really clearing out those seats, getting the spiritual technology, developing your bodhicitta, and then ba -ding, you know, the Buddhists help you, guide you, and you, you, you reach full Buddhahood. So we're all Buddhas in the end. So four results of Buddhist path, just completely as a stream enter. This is what I've just said. When you become an Arya, you higher being by seeing intense uh, directly. Uh, once returner, uh, non-returner, and an Arhat. So we know what an Arhat is. Once returner, often, sometimes, and I don't know why this is. There's probably all the answers in the Abhidharma teachings, but they'll tell you, um, well, basically, you know you have to come back reincarnate uh, one more time to sort of finish off your karma. So you come back and you, know, you become this unbelievable, basically, you know, almost like an our hat or something, like you're this incredible being that you're just sort of finishing up, paying off your karmic debts, just kind of finishing up the movie. It's, you know, whatever one of those Marvel movies is the sequel or something, you've just got to come back for whatever, Avengers part seven or something like I've got the, <laughs> the last little bit I have to do in this world system, and then I'm fully enlightened, right, at that point. Or even I'm fully in our hat, maybe I'm not in our hat, don't have karma to get that thing. I've had an experience that is towards the end of my life, my practice isn't so good, da -da -da -da. so I have to, with all my karma, take rebirth one time, and then the next life, I have these amazing conditions, like I'm you know, taught Dharma as a little kid, and da, 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 I'm just meditating all the time, almost like a tolku, you know, I'm just like this little kid who's like the superstar whiz kid Dharma guy, and then you reach enlightenment, uh, uh, you perceive emptiness in a stable way after that. And then non-return, you never come back to the Karma Datu is the one where you never take rebirth again, maybe you take rebirth in the Pure Lands, or you're just in Nirvana, and you start stabilizing and stable becoming that. So there you go. Um, we can just conclude there. That's more on Nirvana. And that's also, uh, like, I think it's good to know these things to even sort of have a sense, better sense of the path, where we're going. And do we want to, are we going to be a stream enter, non-returner? Do you want to, you know, be an arhat? But for that, of course, Theravada Buddhism, that's the ideal is becoming an arhat which is amazing. You're, you're not a human being at that point. You're an R, you're a higher being. You're this sort of angelic, incredible being that teaches, that has so much meta or uh, compassion, and, and meta is loving kindness, I should say, and karuna compassion, incredible wisdom uh, and concentration. 
that you teach everybody around you. You're an example uh, of the pure path of Buddhism. So, you know, we never think, you know, that you're sort of second rate Dharma guy because you're an Arhat or whatever. It's an incredible thing. But the difference, like, again, my first teacher, against Tarchin said the difference between um, an Arhat and a Buddha is the difference between, uh, let's say, uh, you know, light, an electric light and the sun. There's just this cause. And he said it's like the different, he says, becoming an Arhat. I got to remember this quote from 1995 here, but it's becoming an Arhat is cosmic, becoming a Buddha is galactic. You know, it's like becoming an arhat is the difference between being a human like us and then just sort of being one with our universe, our, the Milky Way in our galaxy, and then becoming a Buddha is galactic. It's all the galaxies. It's that kind of scale. And then he also said that when you do um, the sutric paths, it's like arithmetic, right? The sutric paths allowing you to perceive emptiness directly and become an arhat. It's like uh, all those teachings are just like really amazing math, really good arithmetic. And again, you can do so much with arithmetic, not just balance your checkbook or, you know, we always are phone up, but you can see math. Can, I mean, you can do anything if you know good math, even just like you're renovating your house and do stuff. Um, you know, you can build things. It's incredible. But with Tantra, in particular, High Sugar Tantra, he always said that's like, um uh, calculus like that's like uh, having really good algorithms where we can it's like a computer i mean you know he said it and it's true i mean we, because you have calculus algorithms you can send a rocket to the moon i mean you can calculate all that which is just amazing you can you can see what computers do now it's like magic so that's the difference in scale really between that being on the path to become an arhat and on a path to get fully enlightened buddha there we go. Okay, so thanks for coming. And um, we'll just take a moment to dedicate this. Just through blessings of all holy beings, along our teachers, the truth of karma, Barbara Pierce, your attention again, enlightened, and all sending beings reach awakening. So again, this is all nice, inspiring talk, but let's all sort of gather this together and really make an effort to perceive, and perceive emptiness in this life and really sort of to really try and be stream enters, really see emptiness directly, really try and be our hats as best we can. Okay, thank you everybody. See you next time. I, I have to uh, do another recording this week. I'm gonna be in uh, Japan one last time before I go home. So I'll send out the recording as quick as I can this week. Okay, bye-bye.